these folks. What a blessing they were. What a blessing. And Doug Hudson, the gladiolas are beautiful tonight. We just thank you, Doug. What I'd like you to do is take a look at Revelation chapter 2, would you? Very providential songs to begin this time that we study together in Revelation 2, verse 8 down through verse 11. Let me just read the text and you read it with me. We're writing to the church at Smyrna. Muerta, death. Myrrh, death. Smyrna. It's the city of death. To the angel of the church at Smyrna, write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. What is this text about? Do you remember when Jesus Christ told the parable of the sower about the different seeds? One seed is plucked up quickly, and that's the man that Satan plucks up the seed, lest he believe and be saved. And you've got another one that the thorns grow up and crowd it out. You've got another one that bears much fruit. But the first one fell on shallow soil, and it immediately sprang up, but when the sun came up, it was withered. Jesus gave an interpretation. The one on whom seed was sown on the rocky ground, this is the man who hears the word of God and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but he is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he passes away. He withers. When persecution arises because of the word. Note the key word there, the word when. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. We exult in our trials, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, proof, and proof, hope, or assurance, continually, that we are God's. Persecution. That's the way you tell the guy with the real disease. The author of Hebrews said, So then, let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we seek a city which is to come. If anyone suffers as a Christian, Peter said, let him not be ashamed, but in that name let him glorify God. If for a while, he said, you've been distressed by various trials, if necessary, that the proof of your faith, which is more precious than gold that is perishable, even though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are a people who suffer. Um, where did persecution begin? Cain and Abel. John commenting on that in 1 John said, For this reason Cain slew Abel. For what reason? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. The darkness did not comprehend the light. He hated it. Uh, Elijah said, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, torn down thine altars, I alone am left. Jesus said, Jerusalem, the city that stones the prophets. Jesus said it was not good for him to perish outside of Jerusalem. The, the self-righteous always hate the light. Out of 12 apostles, 11 died unnatural deaths. Second Timothy, all who desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted. From Revelation 6 on, you see the elect of Israel, they are persecuted, and the, the dragon, the devil, sought after the children of the woman who hold the testimony of Jesus. They did not love their own life even until death. No, persecution of the righteous begins in Genesis 3, and it goes all the way into Revelation in chapter 19. When persecution arises because of the word, immediately they melt away. 
Can I give you a little hors d'oeuvre just to start this? I want to give you, give me about six minutes. I want to show you the entire book of 2 Timothy. You're kidding. Watch this. Turn to 2 Timothy just really quickly. I just want to give you a little picture and you stay with me. Oh, that's the most beautiful sound. I love it. The rustling of pages. 2 Timothy, Paul's last will and testament before his death. Every chapter is about suffering, and every chapter has in it the Word of God. We are a people who in chapter 1 in verse 14, 13 and 14, circle those two verses. Timothy, he says, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me and the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. There is a faith that is in Christ Jesus and we are to be dogmatic, but we're not to be nasty. There is a love that's in Christ Jesus. We do not boil in oil and torment and burn at the stake those that disagree. There is a faith and love that are in Christ. Retain the standard of healthy words. Verse 14, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure. The way that you keep weeds from sprouting up in a church is to fertilize the true grass. The way you guard the treasure of the Word of God is by the Holy Spirit. You teach the truth and weeds do not sprout. So Timothy, right there in verse 13 and 14, we are a people who are custodians of a revealed body of truth and we're to guard it, we're to protect it. So much so that in chapter 2, verse 2, after you die, you better pass it on to somebody else. And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, that was Timothy's ordination, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. How many generations of Christians do you get in that verse? You, me, others, uh, faithful men, and others also. Four generations. What this text says to me and to you is, Tom, you're a pastor, you're a Christian, you guard by the Spirit of God this book. You guard it so much that when you die, you have other men in your place that you toss this torch to. To you, with failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. That's the th way that 2 Timothy flows. You guard this book and you pass it on. In chapter 2, if you'll notice, in verse 15, be diligent to present yourself to God as a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We don't add to the word of truth or come up with more truth. We divide an existing body rightly. That's the job of a pastor. A job of a pastor is not to get in a lotus position and come up with new truth. The job of a pastor is to take the existing corpus of truth and cut it straight. He is not to teach what the Word of God means to him. Who cares what the Word of God means to him? It is what the Word of God means, and that's his job. And he tells you in verse 16 and 17, there's a lot of empty chatter. In verse 17, it's like cancer. And so, in verse 21, cleanse yourself from these things. A true Christian is to guard the truth, and he's to have a polarity of thought, a criticalness in how he thinks. Knowing that in chapter 3, verse 1, that in the last days, difficult times will come. There will never be a time that a Christian does not have to stand true and take the heat over the Word of God. If you're not taking the heat over the Word of God, it's because you have gone incognito. And nobody knows who you are. It will get no easier. And he tells you, in verse 10 and 11, you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch. Verse 12, all who desire to live godly will be persecuted. Meaning, Timothy, I held to the word of God and I suffered. You held to it and suffered. Everybody who holds to it will suffer. You cannot get away from it. So what do we do in the face of the suffering that we take for our holding to and being obedient to this revelation that God gives his elect? Well, I'll tell you what you do. Verse 14, you, however, continue in the things you've learned, become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them. From childhood, you have known the sacred writings. Verse 16, all scripture is God-breathed. You don't move one inch. You don't move one iota. You stand true. The great martyr Bradford, as he was burned at the stake, he said to the young saint who suffered and wept next to him, he said, weep not, my brother, we shall have a merry supper with the Lord tonight. What a stud. 
you don't move one inch. Ignatius said as he was thrown to the dogs, I am wheat for Christ. These beasts shall grind my body that I might be found pure bread for the Savior. You don't move one inch. Not an inch. They asked Spurgeon one time, young guy said to him, how can I be a preacher like you? He said, you set your heart aflame for the word of God and men shall come to watch you burn. You don't move one inch. Chapter one, guard it. Chapter two, rightly divide it and pass it on. Chapter three, you suffer for it and you don't move. Chapter four, verse two, preach the word. In season and out of season. That means that if you're Peter and you get 3,000 converts, or if you're Stephen and you get 3,000 rocks, that you still preach. No matter where anybody comes or nobody comes, you don't move. You stand by your post. They said whenever Vesuvius erupted, they found incarcerated in the ashes of Vesuvius a Roman soldier at his post with his spear in hand that would not move in the wake of an exploding volcano. Preach the word, whether they believe or not, and in chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought the good fight, finished the course, kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. It mean, which simply means if you have to die, don't worry. It'll only hurt for a second. <laughs> there is something worse than death, and that is dishonor. And 2 Timothy ends, semper fidelis, always faithful. So what's 2 Timothy about? It's the last will and testament of the Apostle Paul as he passes on the word to the next generation and he says, guard it, study it, hold to it, preach it until you die. That's 2 Timothy. How long do we take? Oh, shoot, we're doing great. Let's go back here to Revelation. Every Christian has to suffer. Being a Christian grants you an advantage in life by the word of God, but it does not grant you immunity. Jesus died, the apostles die, and Jesus said when he sent them out the first time, and I quote, if they called the head of the household Beelzebub, how much more the members of his house? Which simply means, if they hated me, what makes you think that they will like you? Persecution is not only a, a, uh, a fact. Persecution's a requirement. If you are being persecuted for your faith, uh, you have a trial. If you are a Christian and you are not being persecuted and, no, and you're not receiving some looks, well, you need to ask some questions. All who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. In this text that we've looked at in Revelation, We've looked at the church of Smyrna. I think that the church at Ephesus was the church, as we saw it last week, of great orthodoxy, but they lost their first love. That was the church of the first century and the apostles. As you went on into those early centuries, the church came to their canonizations. They began to arrive at their, their systematic doctrines because of heresies that came in, but they began to lose their sense of moral obedience. If you know anything about history, you know that from Marcus Aurelius to Diocletian, you had 10 days of persecution. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. The devil is about to cast you into prison. You'll be tested for 10 days and have tribulation. And I think that that's prophetic. Uh, Marcus Aurelius uh, began to claim that the Christians were atheists. They would not worship the gods of Rome, and hence they were lawless. They began to be persecuted. The persecution went through 10 emperors. The last one was Diocletian. He banned the Bible. He made it illegal to testify that you were a Christian. He imprisoned leaders, and he even went so far as taking the sacrifices offered in the Roman temples and sprinkling the ashes of those sacrifices in the marketplace over the food that the Christians would inevitably have to buy letting them know that their food was sprinkled with the ashes 
offered to the idols. And Christians had to, they felt that it was a, a flaunting of their faith and they had to buy elsewhere or they had to go hungry. And that's what the early church went through, the church of death of Smyrna. Now, as you look at this text, I want you just to, to take a look at it and we'll, we'll re just encapsulate the text for you to see what it says. There's about eight things that are key about persecution. The first thing is in verse eight. Whenever you are going through persecution, you need to make sure of your anchor, of who Jesus Christ is. That he is not like the Wizard of Oz that mocks the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Lion for their insipid request. He has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews says we do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with our heartaches, but one who's been tempted as all things as we are, so that he can come to the aid of those who are tempted. He is called the first and the last. He was dead and has come to life. First and the last is a divine title. Dead is what you and I go to at our lowest point. We die. And he says, I've been there. I was looking at this text today and I got a call from a little girl in our congregation weeping. She said, my mother has just been diagnosed with liver cancer. Could you talk with her? And I got her on the phone. And I don't know what it's like to stare at the Jordan that you're crossing. But I said to her, Miss Phelan was her name, I said, Jesus Christ is the first and the last, and he, is, he has died, and he has come to life. He has faced the Jordan, and he can come back and take you through it. No matter how high, no matter if it gets up in Pilgrim's Progress, to right to the nose of Christian that is crossing it. He has crossed it, and he can take us through it. Now, you make an asterisk by that, because someday you're going to need that. When the, when the machine goes flatline, beep, you're going to just close your eyes and say, Jesus, I hope you're right. Because I can't trust anybody except a nail-scarred hand that when I open my eyes, I believe is going to be there. And so he says, I'm there. In verse 9, something else you need to know is he says, I know your tribulation. Jesus Christ in his glory appeared to Peter through an angel in a cell. He appeared to Paul on a sinking ship. And Nebuchadnezzar said, and I quote, did I not cast three into the furnace? Why is it that I see four? And the one I see looks as unto the Son of God. It looks like a divine being. No matter where you go, he says, I know you're there. Corrie Ten Boom said that every day when she assembled in her death camp, they would take roll, and every day there was a little nightingale that would fly above the prisoners and would sing the prettiest song. And she said, not to be too mystic, but I truly believe that it was God's little postcard to me every day that even though you're in suffering, I know right where you are, and the birds are singing in my presence. The author of the psalm says that though the mountains slip into the sea, that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. There's some place that it's nice and quiet. Like our brother said, Jesus never has a Monday. That's good theology. If you keep looking here in verse 9, he not only knows where you are in persecution, but he states in verse 9 that persecution indicates something, that you are rich. Though you have lost your job and everything, you are rich. Peter said that our faith more precious than gold that is perishable, though tested might by fire. I'll assure you, at the great white throne, when all men stand and face the lake of fire or glory based upon the one-word declaration of the great shepherd, sheep or goat, I'll be willing to bet you could scalp your salvation for any amount that you want to ask. You are rich if everything is known. Verse 9, I also know the bad guys, the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. They were receiving great persecution from the religious community. God says, they say that they are my people. I know that they are not. They are the devil's people. Never think that anybody fools God. One of the great texts of the Bible is the wicked Belshazzar drinking from these, the goblets of God from the temple, mocking God and praising the idols, and it says that a hand writes on the wall, many, many peris upharsin. 
You are weighed in the balance. You are found wanting. And your kingdom is given to the Persians. Meaning, I know who you are. I know what you are doing. You are dead guilty. And when I say die, you are a dead man. Be encouraged. Look at verse 9. He also knows who is behind it. Verse 10. The devil is about to cast you into tribulation. I have a personal belief that one of the greatest books on sin and sovereignty is the book of Job. Here is God glorying in his saint. Satan, have you seen him? The book of Ephesians says that in the saints, the manifold wisdom of God is made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. The angelic realm beholds the glories of the church. It is our trophy. It is his exaltation. Satan, do you see my man? You rebellious angel, do you see that human that loves me? Satan knows his name. Yes, I do. And I believe that you've just blessed him. Let me touch him, and I'll prove to you that you are not worth worshiping. And God pulls back his hedge, allows suffering as far as it will go, and it proves the worthiness of God, and it makes Job a better man, and it shows Satan is dishonored. And I truly believe that you and I are part of a great angelic conflict, and that's why Paul calls us a theater for angels. Unquote. Second Corinthians. The angelic realm watches you as you put on display the worthiness of God. And that's the next point. Not only is Satan behind it, but it is a test in verse 10. You're about to be tested. It is not cosmic phenomena. It is not an accident. This death right here of the saints, God says, I am completely behind it. You know, I get people in our church a lot of times that go through great suffering and pain, and they come to me with a great big question mark. I learned a long time ago that Christians frequently in suffering and death try to put a quick band-aid on pain, and they say it like this, God's not behind it, accidents happen. Now that's an immediate little placebo, but a guy walks away from suffering and death saying, then who is behind it? The fact is, if God is not in control, he is not worthy to be worshipped. What you say when somebody suffers is, like this text says, you're about to die. Evil is present, but it goes no further than I allow it. I'm going to use it for your good, even in these people if they die. When a person goes through great suffering, I have found a long time ago they don't need answers. What they do need is theology, and very specifically, they need Calvinism. I went to Dallas Seminary, like I said, paid good money to be a Calvinist. And I have found out that when you are in suffering, that if God gives you answers, it is no encouragement. But when God says to you what he says here, you're about to die, the devil is behind it. I'm behind him. And I purpose it, even to your death, for my glory. Do you mean that there are no boundaries on what God can do to his own glory? Yes, and that is a comfort. And if I go home tonight and my wife is murdered, I can know that ultimately the devil did it, and behind that is God's sovereign purpose. I do not know why he did it, and I don't care. All that I need to know is that God is behind it. I cannot live in a universe where God is not sovereign. If there is one molecule that is loose on this planet, it might hit another one. And ultimately everything goes askew. I must know that God is not the author of evil, but he is the sovereign engineer of it, and he uses it for my good, my betterment, and his glory. Come whatever may, all I need to know is that God is sovereign. He gave David three choices. You can take famine, you can take your enemies, or rather pestilence, your enemies, or you can let me strike you. David said, let me fall into the hand of God for his mercies are great. David didn't mind suffering as long as he knew that God was behind it. Verse 10, something else. That God is in sovereign control, and that's what you see. You will be tested 10 days, meaning I put a limit on how far evil can go in your life. As a kid up in Kanakuk years ago, youth camp, yeah, any of you ever been uh, rappelling where you jump off the side of a cliff? 
and they couldn't get a kid to go until they convinced him that somebody was going to be holding that rope. You know when the kid finally jumped? When he got his daddy to come hold the rope. He was willing to jump off into space to what could be certain death as long as daddy held the rope. So God says, you're being tested. I hold the rope, and it goes no further than I'll allow it. And in some cases, it went to death. But you can trust him to the other side. That's why the greatest act of faith in the Bible is a fellow that was the Holy One of God, betrayed, rejected, convicted for something he did not do. He himself God, he himself the Savior. And as he dies on the cross, he trusts the Father all the way till his last breath. And he says, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then he bows his head like a soldier, and he gives up his spirit. That, friend, is faithfulness. When good guys suffer evil to the point of death, trusting God all the way to take their spirit and to turn it loose like a canary onto a sovereign finger. That is faithfulness. And that's what happens here. Can God take my life if he is pleased? Revelation 2. Yes, he can. Keep looking. Verse 11 or verse 10. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. There are two words crown in the book of Revelation. One word is the word diadem that is a golden band that a king would wear. That word is not used for Christians. It's used for Jesus Christ. Crown him with many crowns. He comes in Revelation crowned with a diadem. The other time that it's used is the word Stephanos. We get the word Stephen. And it's interesting that your first Christian martyr in the New Testament was named who? Stephen, the crowned one. And what the Stephanos is, it's a laurel wreath that you would give to a person that finished a race. The crown here is to the finisher, to the Stephen, who watches the heavens open as his life leaves and says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That's faithfulness. To that man I will give him the crown of life. Verse 11, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, that he who overcomes occurs in every single church. It is, it's not a condition in the sense that salvation is procured by faithfulness. What it is, is an indication. There is no such thing in New Testament theology as a continually unfaithful Christian. Even if God takes him home to glory in his sin, for there is a sin unto death, 1 John states. Truly saved people are faithful, and they are faithful until death. He that overcomes, 1 John 4, uh, what does it say about the overcomer? Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. A true Christian continues. Though he stumbles seven times, God will lift him up. This is not a condition. This is an indication. How do you know that you're really a saint? You have the birth certificate of propositional faith that you have trusted in the death of Christ. Secondly, you show the birthmarks of a Christian. Your life has changed. Thirdly, you love the family of God. Fourthly, you get spanked. <laughs> Hebrews 12. Whom the Lord loves, he whomps. My translation. <laughs> when you're really a child of God, he puts you into line. The paths of reproof are the way of life. Proverbs. And the other way you know you're a child of God is the deep inner tug. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit. He says, yes, it's true. We are children of God. A true saint, in his heart there rings a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Good theology. Deep down. But the other way you know is that you have not just faithfulness, but continued faithfulness. You die an old, faithful geezer. Geezerology. That is true conversion. He that overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Can I give you a couple of points here as biblically why God allows persecution? Two reasons. To perfect and to prove. 
One good thing about persecution is that it perfects the saint. Let endurance have its perfect result that you may prove perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Story of a Christian in Russia, on, on, in, well, he was in Budapest, he was on the banks of the Danube, and in, on, in Budapest, they narrowed the Danube River, made it artificially, they brought in the deal so the water could uh, get through the town quicker, and it runs faster through Budapest. And one of the, the Christians there that had been through great persecution talked about that river was like persecution. He said, whenever you have persecution, it serves like the waters of the Danube. It runs faster. It runs smaller. But it runs deeper. And he says, that's what persecution does. You don't have as many options when you are persecuted. When you're suffering, your life narrows. But he said, you run deeper. Because you learn to trust God and to love God and depend on God at every single turn of your life. When you have a lot of options, when it's real wide and you can openly wear cross earrings, when you can openly put, in case of rapture, this car will be whatever. You got lots. You ever have one of the guys go by at 80? Almost sort You got lots of options. But sometimes the water doesn't run too deep. But when life narrows on you and it gets intense, you find out you can trust Christ greatly. When Peter is sinking under the waves, he offers one of the great prayers, Lord, save me. You can't eliminate any word of that prayer. They're all essential. And you find that when you get into persecution, you can pray with great brevity, and you can pray with great authority. Lord, save me. Persecution is good. It not only perfects. Incidentally, can you get a great verse? Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, to find out who the real guys are. But I have prayed for you. Now, what would you have prayed if Satan came to God and demanded to find out if you were true or false, wheat or chef. You know what I would pray? God, keep your hand on him and keep Satan back from him. Please, Lord, let him law through life and the luxury and the balm and the sweetness and the happiness of Eden. You know what Jesus said? I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. But after you have fallen you'll repent and strengthen your brothers. Isn't that a terrible prayer? <laughs> I'm not praying that the dogs won't be sicked on you, but I will pray that it will go so far and that it will be used to help you, and when it's all said and done, you'll be a better man. I talked to a brother in the Lord this morning. His wife called me five years ago weeping disconsolately on the phone. He had had an affair. And this guy knew Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he was the first guy when I came to the University of North Texas that showed me what a Christian was. It was this guy. Because he was trying, I was 18 years old. He was a Christian, a real Christian, newly married. He was on a motorcycle. And he went to start the motorcycle and he missed the pedal. And he hit his ankle flush on this uh, metal bar. Hit it and he went, got to do better. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And this guy was an offensive lineman. And I watched him. And here, years later, this guy stumbled into adultery. I talked to him today. Because I watched him. His wife called me and I watched God take him. I mean, the Jordan came right here. And I appealed to him and I said, bro, God's going to take your life if you don't repent. There are some things better than what you think is a desirable romance, and that is honor and your ability to witness. I said to him like Elijah's disciples, there is death in the pot when you mix that junk in your life. You have nothing to say. And he repented. And God brought he and his wife together. They came year, a couple of years later, took me out to breakfast, and they just told me about what the great things God had done in their life. And I talked to him today. He said, you know, I would not wish it 
on anybody. But he said, now in retrospect, I'm glad it happened. Because he said it took that to bring me closer to Christ. I've prayed for you. Your faith may not fail. You always have a mediating high priest that looks after you in trial. So trial deepens you. I can tell you with my life right now, my life has been shaped by about three different five, six round in their mountaintops of pain. In between, there are great valleys of blessing and grass and running brooks. But my life has been shaped by the sovereign activity of God to permit persecution, tribulation, and on some cases, pure, pure stupidity by me that God used for his own glory. I wouldn't do it again for nothing. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Persecution is good. Another thing it does is that it proves who the real saint is. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 makes the statement, about persecution, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment that you might be considered worthy of the kingdom for which you are suffering. Peter, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not feel ashamed, for the spirit of glory in God rests upon you. That's the way you know that God has truly converted a man when he is willing to suffer. It perfects and it proves. Can I show you something great here? What time? Boy, I'm running late. I don't know. What the heck? Who's got a date? No problem. Let's take a look. First Peter, would you? First Peter, chapter one. If you're a girl and has a date, if he makes over 50K, you may leave. Okay, 1 Peter 1. Never attend a single study with men who are paupers. All of 1 Peter is about suffering, okay? Now, I've got 845. It just changed on me. I'm going to take all of 1 Peter and I'm going to sketch this entire book. And I'm going to do it in just a few minutes. You take a good note and when you go home or tomorrow, you read 1 Peter and you watch the exegetical argument of Peter. He is writing late. He's writing in about 63, 64. Rome has descended. Christianity is no longer seen as an innocent threat either to Israel or Rome. They are an honest danger. They have a standard that judges Caesar, and they have a righteousness that challenges what the Jews felt was the temple. Persecution comes from the Jew and the Greek, the religious and the irreligious. Now watch what Peter says about suffering. In suffering, you need to understand verse 3 of chapter 1 you need to understand that we have something that will not move in the storm. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain something that won't fade, an inheritance, meaning we might die, but our inheritance stays there. Whenever I get a Christian in great persecution, great suffering, facing death, I pray with them. And I pray great anchor prayers. I thank you, O Father and our God, that you chose this dear saint from eternity and you've always loved them. Thank you that you sent your son to die for them. Thank you even in hard times that you are sovereign and it works for our good. And even if my dear sister faces death, you were the first and the last and you were dead and you've come to life and you grant victory. I let them focus on a north star that doesn't move. Some things don't change. He also states in verse 5 that persecution has a purpose. We're protected by the power of God because none of us slip through his fingers through faith for a salvation to be revealed in the last time and in this you greatly rejoice even though for a little while if necessary you've been distressed by various trials at the proof of your faith which is precious. So persecution has a purpose. It deepens us. And then he states in verse 13 
how we should live as saved people in a hateful world. Verse 13, gird up the loins of your mind, literally, for action. When a Jewish man would take off running, you didn't have pants, you had those tunics. What you would do is reach down between your legs and you would pull up your tunic. And you kind of had these first century culottes, all right? And you would pull them up and then you would tuck them into your waistband and you had some shorts and you'd take off running. And that's what the term means. That we who are saved on a, on a very hostile earth are not here to fit in. We're here for action. Gird up your loins and don't be distracted. Don't get tripped up by anything of this earth. He tells you in verse, the end of that paragraph in verse 16, be holy. He says in verse 17, he's not only father, but he's judge. He states in 22 what true holiness is, love your brothers. He states in 2 verse 1, long for the word of God to change your life. Live holy. He states in verse 11, I urge you as strangers and aliens, it's a summary verse, that in a wicked world we don't fit in. We're godly people and we're pilgrims going through this land. Therefore, verse 12, keep your behavior excellent. That's the Greek word aretas. Anybody know who the god Ares was? It's Mars. And the Romans held that Ares, Mars, was bigger, faster, tougher, stronger, stronger, quicker than all the pantheon of gods. And the word aratus means bigger, tougher, faster, quicker, stronger. Keep your behavior the best in the eyes of the world. Verses 13 through 17, even if you suffer from government. Verse 18 through 20, even if you suffer in your job from a, from a lousy boss. Everybody asterisk that right there. You keep staying true. Verse 20, you've been called for this purpose. It's normal. Since Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example of suffering his steps. And he mentions in 23 how to respond to suffering. He committed no sin, nor was any hostility found in his mouth. Can you imagine Jesus Christ suffering and them spitting on him? And, and Luke saying, and Jesus spat back at them and saith, fool, I know you. That wouldn't fit, would it? No, whenever you respond to suffering in anger, it always feels good for the moment, but you've lost your testimony. So he says, don't respond in the flesh. Verse 25, Jesus trusted himself to God. 25, you have a shepherd and bishop of your soul. Trust God. He'll take care of you. 3, 1 through 7, boy, that's tough. Even a woman in a bad marriage. Trust God. Let God deal with him. Verse 8, to sum up, be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit. I want to ask you a very penetrating question. Do you have people right now in your Christian life that are giving you fits for being a Christian? That's okay. How are you responding? How are you responding? Harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble. Not returning evil for evil. Don't be playing moral tennis and slamming the thing back. You can't witness to anybody when you do that. No. In verse 10 through 12, the eyes of God are upon the righteous. His face is against the evil one. Therefore, verse 13, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? If a million guys hate you, you make sure God is for you. That's the issue. Is God pleased with you? Watch verse 14. If you do suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. Don't fear their intimidation. Don't be troubled. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Let me show you that verse. It's so good. That verse is a quotation from the book of Isaiah. And God told Isaiah, as he had people hating him, conspiring against him, he said, don't fear their intimidation. It is God whom you shall fear. And he'll be your sanctuary. Which means, Isaiah, don't be afraid of your intimidators. Fear me. God plus one's a majority. If I'm for you, you don't have to worry. Peter takes that verse. Don't fear their intimidation. Fear Christ. Is he pleased? Whenever R Latimer and Ridley died at the stake, one turned to the other and said, My brother, fear not. We shall light such a fire that shall be seen throughout all of England. 
You be faithful all the way until the death, as long as Christ is with you. Whenever Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, died, he said, I think it was these 60 and 8 years has my Savior loved me and been faithful to me. Can I now deny him? And he died. Faithful until death. Verse 16. No, I'm sorry, 17. That it's better if God should will it that you should suffer for doing right rather than for doing what is wrong. Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. Meaning, if you're suffering for righteousness, you're following the lead of your Savior. Now watch this in 18. He was put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. What that means is they killed his body and they released his little s spirit like a parakeet and it flew into the hands of eternity. Even though that you die, no one can get your soul. And that's the second death. It's when your soul is tormented away from God with the devils of hell. He says, no, Christ suffered death in the flesh, but he's made alive in the spirit. Now watch this. Verse 19, he went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. Can I give you the classic Jewish interpretation of this verse? It's from Genesis 6. There was a day when the sons of God went into the daughters of men, saw that they were beautiful. It was the pre-flood earth when the demonic realm tried to corrupt the earth through these demons that crossed a line. And they took to themselves human form. And it was in, verse 20, these spirits were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. The idea is, and this was the Jewish interpretation of this verse, and I think it's right, that those spirits who were disobedient in the days of Noah, those demonic spirits that tried to corrupt the earth, they lost their, what they tried, and God condemned them into what is called the abyss. It's called here in verse 19, prison. It, that's a Greek word called Tartarus. It has no correspondence in the English language. And all that it means is a pit, a place that's reserved in darkness. After Jesus Christ died, I believe that his spirit went to two places. It went into the presence of Abraham's bosom with the Old Testament faithful that waited for his death and atonement, and he, Ephesians 4, led captive captivity into the presence of God. And then he went into prison to the spirits who once were disobedient in the days of Noah when they tried to intimidate and to challenge and to corrupt God's plan and he made proclamation to them that he had defeated them and he condemned them forever and then he ascended into the very presence of God as our mediator. The idea is Jesus Christ suffered and won and in verse 21 and corresponding to that faith in Christ, i.e. baptism, saves you. Not the physical act of getting dumped, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ. 22, who reigns over all. He's at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels, authorities, the demonic realm, powers were subjected to him. The idea from verse 14 on is, you go ahead and suffer. Because Jesus suffered and he rose and he reigns victorious, and corresponding to that, you will too. They can just kill you once and your spirit lives forever. One great saint said as they beheaded him to let the headsman's axe fall for they would free his soul, as Moses said, to fly away. Saints, there are some things more important than life. There are some things more important than the escape from pain, and that is faithfulness to our sovereign God. And if we die, we die. Esther. If I perish, then I perish. Jesus reigns, and so will I. Chapter 4, verse 1. Christ suffered in the flesh. Arm yourself with the same purpose. That resignation to die is seen as a weapon. Who is the most feared enemy in the world? My father-in-law fought in the South Pacific, and he told me. He said, there is no greater fear than to fight a kamikaze. He said, I saw them coming with bombs strapped to their fuselage with a tank of gas to get them out, but not to get them back, knowing that they had already gone through in Japan their funerals. And those men were resigned to death. My father-in-law said, if you've ever been on a boat 
and seen a Japanese plane go up to fly down your smokestack, and you knew that you had about eight seconds to shoot him down, he said, that is the ultimate video game. There is no army so fearsome as a Christian who has armed himself with a kamikaze spirit. Jesus suffered in the flesh. We arm ourselves with the same purpose. We are not going out to go back. When Cortez's army landed in Mexico, they started off to find gold, looked behind them, and they saw the smoke rising of their ships that had been ignited. There was no way back. There's no way back. We die. We're dead men. That's the way it is. And that is strength. Bear Bryant used to say to his kickoff team, why do you want to live forever? Get down the field. And that's the way you have to be. So that willingness to die is not seen as weakness. That is an immortal spirit. You got the drift? I'll stop there. That's the whole gist of 1 Peter. The willingness of a saint who will die. I got four minutes. You got a second? Bill Shakespeare. Nobody leaves till Bill speaks. One of his most famous works, histories, was Henry V got so famous that they made a movie out of it. If you've ever seen it, it's a great movie. And there's one particular speech. A lot of you have heard it. It's been made famous in the last few years. As a matter of fact, you saw it on that great piece of drama, Renaissance Man, Danny DeVito. <laughs> Guy said it on Renaissance Man. Couldn't believe it. One of the greatest pieces of oratory ever written on courage. Henry V and his English troops ready to fight at Flint, France. They are hopelessly outnumbered. If they win, the casualties will be astronomical, but they fight for the glory of England. They gather to go to battle, and his cousin, Westmoreland, speaks. Oh, that we now had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. Henry, what's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland, no, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss, and if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, not wish not one man more. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold, nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not if men my garments wear. Such outward things dwell not in my desires, and if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. No faith, my cuz, wish not a man from England. God's peace, I would not lose so great an honor as one man more, methinks, would share from me for the best hope I have. Oh, do not wish one more. Rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart and his passport shall be made crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispin. And he that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when his name is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is the feast of St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispian's day, old men forget, yet all shall be forgot. But he will remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury, Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, 
we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now in bed, shall think themselves accursed they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap while any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. He said, dodge the fight. I welcome it. For there are some things more important than life, and that is death and glory and honor. The head of the Boy Scouts from years ago, Baden Powell, a noble Christian, when he died, you see on his tombstone one sign. And if you're a Boy Scout, you know what it is? A circle with a dot, which means broke camp, gone home. That's the sign of the Christian. If you die, then saint, don't you pray to escape it. You die well. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, how precious we hold our lives, how cheap we hold your glory. And I pray for any of us that have stilled our lips that we might dodge the bullet, that you might give us the sanction and the grace to stand in the gap. And when the battle is called, and when the shells fly, and when we are called to give an account for the hope that is in us, might we do it with clarity, with diligence, with courage, with consistency, with gentleness, and with honor. I pray that you might bring a sanctified shame to those of our midst that have dodged, those that have retreated in the face of battle. And I pray that you would spur us on to things far greater than our life and our possessions, and that is the pleasure of God and the crown on that day. For we shall thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.